Hello everyone, uh, this is Kevin Morrison. I'm the Cook County Commissioner representing the 15th District in the Northwest suburbs of Cook County. Um, I'm really excited about today's event and I wanna first start off by thanking everyone who's tuning in live, uh, as well as those of you who may be watching this recording. Uh, just a friendly reminder, uh, if you have any questions for any of our incredible panelists today, please put those in the live comments and we'll be happy to address them as soon as we get to the discussion section of today's conversation. Uh, first, I wanna welcome everyone to my first virtual environmental resource fair. If you haven't registered, please do so now. Uh, the link uh, to register is in the comments below. Uh, it's free to register. And the great thing is, uh, once you register, you are gonna be entered in to a chance to win a smart thermostat. How cool is that? Um, I wanted to host this event because I'm passionate about the environment in many ways, including protecting it by being more sustainable and energy efficient. Uh, Cook County has also made the environment a priority by developing a clean energy plan. The goal is to achieve 100% renewable energy uh, electricity by 2030 and a carbon neutral footprint by 2050 for Cook County owned buildings. A healthy and equitable environment is also part of Cook County's policy roadmap. One of the six goals of the policy roadmap is to support healthy, resilient communities that thrive economically, socially, and environmentally. Objectives include ensuring environmental justice and a healthy environment for all people and places in the county, promoting livable, sustainable land use, transportation, and economic development reducing climate change and mitigating its effects, capturing the job growth potential of making Cook County more sustainable, and creating capacity in local municipalities and communities to build their own sustainable future. I'm proud to be on a board of commissioners that takes being good stewards of the environment seriously. Each of the resources discussed today will help us ensure a healthier ecosystem for the next generation. With that, I'd like to introduce our first guest speaker. Uh, we've got a great panel of environmental uh, leaders, uh, and I'm excited today to introduce Vitya Hill from Elevate Energy. Vitya, thank you so much for being here today. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, so yes, I'm Vitya Hill. I'm with Elevate Energy. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization, and I'm a community organi organizer. So I have the privilege to uh, have conversations like this with different communities um, as we're pulling up my uh, slides. Um, so thank you everyone for taking the time to um, continue to educate yourself because that's what this is all about. Ultimately, even if we know things, it's always nice to be reinformed. Um, so we can uh, push through to the next one. So uh, Elevate Energy, we stand on smarter energy use for all. So if Justin, you want to move to the next slide. If you can see the next slide, I can't. Can you guys hear me or no? We can hear you. Uh, Justin is working on moving it to the next slide. Okay, well, that's okay. We'll, I'll just keep pushing through. So, uh, and I'm looking at my, my uh, presentation. So we we're, we're, uh, represent ourselves as smarter energy use for all. So that's, we give, uh, there you go. We give, thank you, Justin. We give people the resources they need, um, making informed, educated choices um, so they can save money and, and you know, be comfortable in their home and, um, create jobs with the different um, programs that we have, and then um, it helps the environment also, and then for all. So we are very committed to making sure that different other communities that really need it the most get uh, this information. So I'm gonna go to the next slide, okay. And again, so we're a nonprofit established in 2000. We get our funding from ICEF, which is the Illinois Science and Energy um, Innovation Foundation, um, which is, we, uh, CUB also gets funding uh, as well from that program or that foundation. Um, again, we're just looking to help people cut costs, protect the environment, and then make sure that people are getting the information they need to advocate for themselves and, and um, have 
resources um, that they can use today to make a difference in their home. So um, really quick, what, what uh, we talk about the smart grid, we talk about smart meters, I'm sure we've heard about it. So the smart grid is, uh, or uh, the grid, if you will, it's now called the quote unquote smart grid, but it's everything, the infrastructure that we use, that's used to get electricity um, to our homes. And um, it wasn't uh, updated for like a hundred years, been recently updated not recently, but everyone should have access to, quote unquote, the new grid, um, and it was completed by 2018. So what that d did was create the ability to have smart meters in our homes. And because there was not a back and forth communication between the, uh, your uh, utility company to your home, these grids offer that um, two-way communication such that if something happens, if you have a blackout or a brownout, um, or even if you're you having issues with your costs or the, the, the rates change on a daily basis or an hourly basis, actually, and we'll talk about that later. And so your meter can keep track with that such that your bills are accurate every time. And it wasn't like that before. So um, that was a huge and it cost billions of dollars to, to um, in ComEd um, based on a lot of you know federal changes. They, they had to do that. So. If you are, whether if you're in ComEd or Ameren territory, so if you live in Illinois, you either have two choices. So they will deliver your electricity. Now, if you, again, I'm so sorry, my head is bopping up and down because I'm on my phone, but you do have options for your supply. And these are conversations uh, that it bring up a lot, a lot of confusion. So let's, so you will always be delivered from ComEd or Ameren, no matter what, you do get to make your own choice. So whether you get your supply from ComEd or Ameren, whatever your standard utility company is, wherever you live, you get the choice to change to an alternative supplier. And then if you're in a certain, sometimes rural areas or certain communities have um, municipal um, opportunities where they make arrangements with different alternative suppliers. So you're rate may be different. But if you have any questions about any of this, there's a website right here, www.pluginillinois. You should advocate for yourself and, and look into that to see where you stand, but also your bill is important. Where's my, okay. Okay, so if you are a person that thinks you made uh, a choice to, to uh, participate with an alternative supplier, um, your bill will come in as ComEd, your bill will come in as Ameren, and um, what you will look at is, so this is an example of a comment bill. What you will look at is your supplier. Um, that's, if it's comment, it would say comment. If it doesn't, then you have signed up with an alternative supplier. And um, so I went to the next page already, but if it's slow, it's okay. Um, but if you have your comment bill, this is something that you should look and pay attention to if you're not sure. Um, some people do get signed up weirdly in weird ways. I was one of those people. I chose to sign up. So it wasn't like a, you know, but uh, I, I ended up paying 11 cents per kilowatt hour, which is crazy. Um, so sometimes we sign up thinking we're getting a good, a good deal. Cub is really great if you're having issues getting out of those type of agreements. Um, to help you figure out how to make sure you go back to making sure you're getting a, a, a rate that, that makes sense for you. So because we're all using the grid, everyone does. It's, it's statewide. It's nationwide. Every state has its own uh, different mandates. But um, dynamic pricing, thank you. So we're, so ComEd was forced to come up with different programs because there are so many issues with customers What uh, in regards to billing. So uh, ComEd came up with ways to, to do two things, help customers save money, consumers save money, but also we do help um, give incentives for consumers to reduce their, uh, what we're doing on the grid. Now, the interesting thing is that we're, as consumers, we don't do the, the most work on the grid. Our, our, we don't, um, we're not the most demanding on the grid, it's businesses. Um, 
or you know, where grocery stores, whatever is the brick and mortar stores or things that we go to that require so much AC or heat, they're the ones that are um, using a lot, demanding a lot, but as but we can help. So, um, which is nice. So they came up with programs, next slide, dynamic pricing programs. So when you sign up for Ameren or ComEd, if you're getting your standard regular, um, I, I, you know, renting or purchasing this home and I'm signing up for ComEd uh, or getting my electricity bill in order in my name, they will automatically put you at a fixed rate cost, fixed rate. At this time, it's 6.195. ComEd rate, ComEd's rates, uh, rates change twice a year. But one of the cool things is because, or, well, one of the, the fact is, is that the, the electric uh, electricity market rate changes and fluctuates hourly. So they, you know, there's a program where you can sign up for something called hourly pricing. I'm moving uh, two slides up and I'm gonna show, um, Justin's gonna show the screen of the comments hourly pricing program, what it actually looks like. If you, if you can go and you can take the time to go to look at um, comments hourly pricing on their website and you can see um, in actual times, um, what the rate is. So at this, I'm, I'm really pushing for this. Uh, we're all at home. We're, we're really utilizing the most electricity that we've ever used in a, in, a, in a long time, right? We're not, we're not gone for periods of hours anymore. So we're, we're here. So, um, I really think that people should, should look into this, um, because again, the market fluctuates. So like I said, the previous slide showed that it was 6.195 cents is the fixed rate. Um, and this is an old slide. Um, when I say an old, it's probably a week or a week and a half. But this is the highest point of the day. If you see, it's five cents. Go, no, go up forward, back to where you were. That was good. Yeah. So it's five cents. That's the highest that it was that day. But still, it's still 1.95 cents less than the fixed rate that you're going to be charged anyway. So if you want to look into this and make a choice to sign up for hourly pricing, I think it's a good idea. I signed up and say 58%. I mean, and I've been working for, <laughs> I, you know, it's just all this information. I've been working here for a while and I'm just like, oh, you know, and I started looking at my bill and I realized that, oh shoot, I'm not paying attention. So to my, uh, the next slide, um, you know, wasn't paying attention to signing up for alternative supplier hourly pricing. So just right away saving money just with making some simple choices. And then um, peak time saving is another one you can, this is, um, uh, this is just when you sign up, you get a text or email that says, hey, can you reduce your energy use or electricity use at this time? And you get a little bit of credit, you get 50 cents, six cents. The most I've gotten was six bucks back on my, my um, comment uh, bill. So, um, but mostly it's really about helping reduce uh, the demand and then helping, um, you know, it's like a good neighbor. It's like, if I can reduce and they can't type of thing. But what happens is when there's so much demand on the grid, we have to, um, you know, we, there's nuclear power plants in the suburb of Illinois that have to be generated or, you know, used so that we can get um, energy and that's not good for the environment. So that's like the biggest thing. So when you do small things like this, you think it's small, it's, it's, you're not getting that much back, but it's actually making a difference over time and as a whole. And once you start to look at things. So um, as we uh, talk about ele energy use and electricity use, and um, we want to talk about how we're losing our energy mostly. A lot of people think our windows is where the energy is lost and actually it's our attic and basement. So if you have a single family home, um, this is uh, something to really look into because 68% of home energy loss comes from there. And that's because, um, you know, when you're doing things in the attic, when you're doing things in the basement, you're cutting holes, you're getting your cable put in, blah, blah, blah. And sometimes you don't go back and check to see if those holes are packed up. Sometimes you don't check and see if our insulation is still suffice for the next coming um, season. So um, what we talk about is air signal insulation. So there are some things that you, you can do right away to mitigate some of that home energy loss. And that includes caulking your windows. So versus replacing your windows, you can caulk them. You can do some little updates, make sure the trimming's right. 
Um, you can go to your attic and seal around the pipes and wires. Um, and uh, these are things that if you can't do it or you can half want to do it, it's, it's not as expensive as you think when it comes down to um, the overall energy cost throughout the year. And then the, 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 the one of the small steps you can do is just get new lighting, LED lights. Um, it lasts up to 25,000 hours or 14 years. So it's like once if you replace them all, you won't have to worry about it for a while. And that's it. <laughs> oh, that think, was amazing. Did we get it all? I believe so. Thank you so much, Vitya. I really appreciate uh, your run through. Um, next <laughs> up. <laughs> no, it's great. Um, Amy, Wait, do we there, have you? There are no story? questions, so I should, I'm done. Oh, oh okay. well, we'll have questions toward the end, I believe. Okay, cool. Awesome. Amy, how's your uh, technology holding up? Um, I changed rooms and I changed uh, internet sources, so now everything's great. <laughs> Amazing. Well, then next up, we have Amy English from uh, CUB, or the Citizens Utility Board. Amy, thank you so much for being here with us today. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. And I do want to thank um, Vatia from Elevate for giving us a shout out. I will try to go as quickly as I can. And then if there's anybody that wants me to elaborate on anything, we'll do questions at the end because I know we have a, a time a time budget. Um, so Citizens Utility Board, we are a statewide consumer watchdog group. We've been around since 1983. Um, we were created by the Citizens Utility Board Act. So that means that we have an actual statutory role to play. Um, that role is to represent the interests of the public in all like legal and regulatory proceedings that have to do with utility service. That includes um, challenging rate hikes, uh, fighting for different consumer protection laws. We also do educational seminars and outreach. I think Vatia will explain. I am so sorry. I knew that was going to happen. I asked for a one dog bark uh, quota. <laughs> Quiet. Um, we um, we're we have a grant that funds our outreach work. So the rest of our operations are funded through donations from individual consumers. But for stuff like this, we have some supplemental funding from ISEF. And we have a consumer hotline. So that number at the bottom of the screen is 1-800-669-5556. So as Batia said, we do take complaints, especially about those alternative suppliers. Um, one of our most important services is utility bill checkups. We normally, um, prior to the COVID um, stay at home order, we were doing hundreds of events every year around the entire state. So we have an outreach team that was traveling anywhere that anybody asked us to go. Um, and we would, we would speak on topics, but we would also look at bills. And when we sit down and look at the bills, um, we look for overpriced energy suppliers because there is so much choice in the market. There's also there's plenty of opportunities for people to inadvertently overpay. We look at energy consumption and we make recommendations for programs based on the individual's uh, household profile. So if somebody's in a single family home, there's a certain set of programs that might be available to help them reduce their energy consumption. And we also do a lot with the demand response programs like hourly pricing. Um, we do referrals for bill payment assistance as well. And now since we're not able to go, oops, we're not able to go out and about, we are reviewing bills electronically. So if you'd like to send them in by email, that email address is UBC uh, at citizensutilityboard.org. And that'll be repeated at the end as well. Amy? Yeah. Hey, we can't see your slides. Oh, okay, hold on a second. Let me see what's going on. see have you seen were you seeing the slides before or did they ever start they've never been up okay can you see them now yep well you're okay. sharing but we'll be able to see them once you share the slides yep now we see them okay 
All right, I'll just start from this point then. Sorry about that. This is a day for bad technology, I think. Um, so programs that we recommend when we do a utility bill uh, checkup, hourly pricing, like Batia was talking about, um, we have found that the typical consumer saves at least 15% on their supply rates. I am on hourly pricing myself, and I've saved um, hundreds of dollars. I think the most recent report I got was over $600. I've been on it for several years, so it's a, it's a really good program. Um, peak time savings, you can get a credit on your bill in the summer months. That's an easy one because there's, there's, uh, there's no downside to it. So we try to encourage everybody to sign up for that one. Central AC cycling, that's a $10 credit on your bill in the summer. You can't do that. You can either do hourly peak time or central AC cycling. Central AC cycling is the one where they put a device on your air conditioner and it enables the company to cycle the compressor down at peak demand times. That's, a, that's $10 whether or not they actually activate that option. So that's a, another one that's real easy to participate in. And the um, activation is usually uh, completely imperceptible to the homeowner, so it's harmless. Um, we also make referrals to the Chicago Bungalow Association Energy, Sa uh, Energy Savers Program. They do single family home uh, retrofits, so they do all sorts of energy efficiency upgrades. Uh, Elevate Energy's multifamily uh, retrofit program as well. And then the CETA weatherization program if you're within uh, the income guidelines. So there's a lot of different things that you can uh, sign up for or apply for that can help you as an individual reduce your household energy burden. So that's our goal in the utility bill clinics is to come up with a, a set of recommendations that are kind of tailored to the individual homeowner uh, and or renter. So this slide, I won't, I'm not going to read all the details, but this is just an overview of financial assistance programs. In case there's anybody that's tuned in today that uh, might be in need of financial assistance, or is wondering if they're eligible for it. This is a list of all the different uh, programs that are available to provide grants on utility bills. Um, the Illinois Commerce Commission recently ordered the utilities to set aside extra funds to help people reduce their bills after the COVID stay at home order and the economic crunch that we've all been facing. So there's the traditional light heat program and then all the utilities have their own financial assistance programs, and now they also have extra programs that are under the COVID settlement umbrella. So there's an awful lot of different options. You can see the grant amount. Um, most of the programs do not require a social security number. Um, and so there's, if, if anyone has a question about that, I can give more information at the end. Um, energy suppliers is a really big issue for us at Cub. Um, the energy market was deregulated many years ago. So there's a number of different companies that are soliciting in a number of different ways. Um, in some scenarios, it's possible to save, but what we have found consistently over the years is that most consumers lose when they sign up with an alternative company. Um, if a town were to enter into a municipal aggregation contract, there are savings to be had. Um, but I always like to remind everybody that that depends on how much you trust your local elected officials to make those decisions for you. There have been a couple scenarios where the town did not get the best possible rate, but overall that's a safer model than going it alone um, because these are these companies are in business to make money and it's pretty hard for them to make money um, by giving you a discount. So if you do sign up with an energy supplier, it usually makes the bill go up. It can eat up a LIHEAP or energy assistance grant. Um, there's a lot of problems with the slamming, which is when the company switches you without your full authorization or without your full understanding of what you're signing up for. Um, a lot of the offers have teaser rates. So that means that if the company, they, they don't have to lie to you because they can, they can tell you in black and white or look you straight in the eye and say that their price is lower than ComEd's standard rate. Um, but that's because it only stays that way for a certain amount of time and after that it goes up dramatically. So it's like a credit card with an introductory APR. It's great for a minute, but after that it's overwhelmingly expensive. Um, so there have been some lawsuits and investigations and legal settlements. 
Uh, so now there's some consumer protections available, but the market is still kind of dangerous. They have to uh, have a third party verification recording in order to seal the deal. You have 30 days from the receipt of your first bill to cancel. They're not allowed to do in-person solicitation inside buildings. That was a really big problem, especially in Chicago and some of our senior buildings. They would get inside and sneak past security and be going door to door, knocking on individual units. They are not allowed to do that anymore. Um, there's no more exit fees whatsoever. And there's no more switching of accounts that have received assistance through the LIHEAP program. So that means that if you apply for assistance through LIHEAP, the utilities have your account flagged as a low income account. And that account is protected from switching unless the, util unless the alternative supplier has filed a guaranteed savings plan. So since none of the companies are actually able to guarantee savings, that means in effect that low income accounts are have an extra layer of protection and they really can't be switched. And there should be no in-person solicitation whatsoever during the COVID-19 stay at home order. And that is still in effect right now, even though the state of Illinois is in phase four and some things are opening up, you should not be getting any door to door solicitors asking to see your energy bill. So with that, I will clear the floor for the next uh, presenter and we'll stick around and make sure that we can answer questions. Thank you so much, Amy. That was incredibly helpful. Um, next up, we have Rebecca Cook from CNT, the Center for Neighborhood Technology. Rebecca, thank you so very much for being here today. Rebecca, you're still muted. We've had lovely technology uh, <laughs> issues today. Are you seeing the mute button on your screen? Yes, I can unmute. I'm just trying to get my PowerPoint to come up. So one second, please. It won't let me pick just PowerPoint, so here we go. Hi, my name is Rebecca Cook, and I am from the Center for Neighborhood Technology, which we call CNT. Um, CNT is a 40-year-old think and do tank that um, basically thinks about things, and I want you to remember that as we go through this presentation today, that we don't necessarily do the things that we're talking about. We think about how to make them work, and we help homeowners come up with solutions so that they can create the right solution for themselves. Um, we've created a couple of big things. Igo Car came out of CNT, Elevate Energy um, came out of CNT. And so now they handle a lot of the things that we do or we used to do in energy and the things that we currently do now in flooding, which is what I'll be talking about today. So we're gonna just go through a really basic presentation about how water works through your home because none of us are really taught that when we are in school are ever taught about how water really works in and around our community. So first we're gonna go over what we know already about things. Fact one is when we flush the toilet, we run our water, we take a shower, all that water goes well somewhere, right? We're not necessarily sure what happens to it. Just to give you a small illustration of what happens, when you do anything, any water leaves your home, it goes out of your private line into the municipal main line and off to um, the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, MWRD, where it's cleaned and sanitized and dealt with in some kind of way, okay? Um, we know that because that happens with our water, that our water does go through some kind of recycling process, that that water is um, taken out of our homes as waste, it is cleaned or treated in some kind of way, and then it is put back into our, our main water systems. In this situation, it goes into our rivers, it goes into the Mississippi River, and everybody downstate gets whatever we are flushing or putting down. And I take this time to say that means it's very important that you're not flushing down pharmaceuticals. Wipes tear up the system, even if they say that they're flushable wipes, and other... Um, things. I found out in my lifetime and the way that I even when I watch TV, people see the toilet as a black hole and they can just flush anything down it. 
Um, and that's just not the case. That water is going somewhere. And it's possible that if you put it down there and enough other people are putting that same thing down there, that you might drink it again. So think about that before you flush it. And then our last fact is that we know that there are people who flood, but they have to be in a floodplain, right? Whatever that is. So I'm going to let you know, we'll take our first step to explain what a floodplain is. If you look at this image, you're going to see that there is a small depression. And in that depression, there is a waterway. That little, let's just call it a river, okay? And that river's official name is a floodway. And that little bank that the river is in is where the water kind of exists. If it rains really, really heavy and that water, that um, body of water begins to overflow, that tree and that house is going to get wet. And because those two things are going to get wet, they are considered to be in the flood plain because they have a high instance of getting wet. The two trees that you see at the top of the hills are not very likely to get wet at all. It have to be some kind of major catastrophe for that water from that body of water to rise that high. And so they're not considered in the flood plain. And this is all important as we talk about insurance and um, the federal government kind of determines where the floodplains are with your state in this case, the state of Illinois, to determine who has a floodplain, what kind of insurance they should get, what their risk factor is for flooding, and therefore what their rates are going to be. And all of these things play into how we perceive flooding and what we think we need to do in order to mitigate flooding, and even how our disasters are claimed when we do have serious waters. So we heard that definition of that's traditional flooding, and we at CNT decided that that wasn't the only thing that was happening, that there were more people flooding and having issues within particularly the city of Chicago and the, and the surrounding county, actually within Cook County. Um, and we gave it another name that we call urban flooding. And we say that urban flooding is coming from your actual sewer system and your pipes. That means that your pipes can overflow and cause you to flood in addition to having seepage. So I have this definition up. If you wanna read our official definition, it's there. Um, you might be able to refer back to it later. We have four types of flooding that we consider to be urban flooding. Our number one is the overbank flooding. That goes back to our floodplain that says that a large body of water gets too much water basically through rain or as large storm or flows. We don't really experience very much overbank flooding in this region. There's some small places in the south suburbs that do experience some flooding from um, the Calumet, and I think in the west from the Displains. But from the most part, there's not a whole lot of overbank flooding heading, um, heading in this region. Then we have overland flooding. This is very common external flooding that we pretty much all see. It's that little sheen of water that you'll see sitting over grass or sidewalks. It only happens outside, although it can pull up and be next to your house, which in turn can cause seepage. And seepage is when water sits up against your home. Even though we mostly say that concrete is impervious and nothing can get through it, it does have some granular holes in it so that water over time can particulate through the cement and come into your house. I also learned when I took this job on that water has pressure. And that means the groundwater that exists under all of our homes, it can have... Um, it can start to put pressure on the foundation of your house. And over time, as that pressure builds up, it can create a crack. And if you look closely into this um, PowerPoint, you'll see small little cracks that have begun to um, come through the, the bottom of the floor. And that water began to seep up into those cracks. It can also do the same thing on the sides of the house. If you have water after it rains, it just sits near your home. Over time, that water can kind of come through your walls. We also call seepage any water that comes in through the windows. If you have, a, um, especially in a basement, a window well, and there's water kind of pooling in that window, and it begins to seep through, or any water that comes in under a door. Um, we all call it that. That qualifies as seepage. And then the last one, the queen of them all, she who shall not be named is the sewer backup. And we call it the grossest of the flooding because it is the one that terrorizes a lot of people in this region. It is the nastiest to deal with because it means that everything that you flush down, everything that your neighbors flush down comes back. And um, that's what really causes the most grief in a lot of the situations that we see is that in mostly in basements, although I have heard some people tell me 
in very, very bad storms. They've had water all the way up into their first floor that it comes up through their sink faucets, their toilets, their drains. Um, everywhere that water is normally able goes down becomes a, a fountain where it comes up. And that's where we have the, the greatest problems. So just to give you a small illustration of how this works, um, we'll just see here that uh, you have a home, it begins to rain. And then as the water comes down, eventually that water that went down to your municipal line comes back up into your house. And it's a terrible situation. We don't, um, we don't, we don't like it. And this is why, why does this have to happen? So what do we do about that? We've seen all of these issues. How do we figure out how to deal with these issues that um, in some ways can seem like we don't have any control over them because it is a rain and we can't control the rain. First, let's have just a little bit better understanding of what's going on. So there's this word out there, we call it climate change and some people don't believe that it exists, but um, we're just gonna work right now like it does exist. Um, and that as time has gone on, when we used to live, we had a mostly green um, landscape Everything was green. When it rained, water was able to go down. It could be absorbed into the ground. No big deal. Almost all of it went in. Then we started building homes. And then we had a little bit of what we call impervious surface. And impervious just means that nothing can get through it. And so now we have just a little bit of water that doesn't have quite somewhere to go. But we build a sewer system. It takes in some of that water. We figure out how to get rid of it. Then as time moves on, we start raising more and more of our green space, building up more homes until we have our major urban counties like what we have here in Cook County and our big cities. And then 70 to 100% of our landscape is impervious, which means that that water hits the ground and it has nowhere to go. There's nothing to absorb it. And that becomes a really serious issue with how we deal with our rainwater as we start to consider that we're getting heavier and more frequent rains now than we ever have before. We used to have a term that we called it a hundred year flood or a hundred year rain. And are they now call it a 1% rain. And that used to mean that every hundred years you'll get this big storm that you'll have water. You won't have so much of it. You won't know, have anything to do with it. And here in the Chicago region and Cook County, it is very wet. Cook County used to be a swamp. And a lot of times in this natural landscape, it is trying to kind of return to living to that swampy area. And so when you have these heavier rains that are being caused by our pollution and all of the things that we're sending up, it's kind of pushing us back down with these, these um, showers that are happening more frequently and heavier. The systems that we had or that we built were just not built to deal with that kind of rain um, on that kind of consistent basis. So as we look at those things, we just kind of need to understand how our sewers work in general. So in some of our newer suburbs, we have a separated system, which means that your wastewater goes down one pipe and your rainwater goes down another pipe. They go to two different systems. They're treated and dealt with separately. Usually, even if you have a basement backup issue, you're not going to get the flushing issue of what we flush down the sewage back because that went down into a separate pipe that went somewhere else. And when it rains, that rainwater can't overflow your pipe. But when you have a combined system, which is a system that we have in Chicago and most of our very old suburbs, is that all of your um, rainwater comes down, all of your wastewater comes down, and then they combine into one pipe. When that rainwater overwhelms that wastewater pipe, because they're all in one then that water has nowhere to go. It starts to come back up into the places where it went down, which is how we get that basement backup issue. And um, there are a lot of people who say, well, you know, just replace all the pipes, just build a bigger one, we can deal with it. But uh, those piping systems are very expensive. The village of Riverdale um, cried and complained because they have massive issues. There's some basements that are taking in four feet of water and um, after decades of you know saying we can't deal with it, please help us, please help us. President Preckwinkle went down and said, okay, I'm gonna come and bring you some aid. After we had a declaration of a disaster, there was a little bit more money in the county that they had to deal with flood issues. She gave $7.2 million to the village of Riverdale to deal with their flooding issues. That $7.2 million was put onto one block to build a larger pipe to separate their system. 
and they still will probably have some flooding issues because if they don't put in green infrastructure, because even with that much larger pipe, the way that the water and the rain comes down, a pipe and great infrastructure system in and of itself just can't deal with it. And so when I tell that, people start to really recognize that money or throwing money at our problem is not going to be enough. And our municipalities and our governments just don't have enough money to be able to fix those problems on that magnitude. And like I said, they still have to deal, do something in order to deal with that extra water that comes down. So uh, one last thing that people tell me all the time is I don't have to worry about flooding because I have insurance. Insurance is going to help you deal with some of the issues that happen after you flood. They're not necessarily going to try to keep you in any way drier or keep that rainwater from coming down. So insurance is great to have and you should have it if you definitely if you know you have a water issue. But you have to be careful because there's some things about insurance that we all need to know. One thing, there's public insurance and there's private insurance. And the public insurance comes from FEMA. It's your NIFP insurance that everyone is, has free access to. Anyone can get it. It's kind of odd because it's sold through your private insurance, like your state farms or your Allstate. But it's publicly um, regulated and mandated, which means that you can't be canceled. But even if you have that insurance and it's part of your, um, your plan, you need to understand that no one recognizes putting your clothes and your personal effects into your basement as insurable. So if you put those private things down into your basement, they will not be insured. They will not be covered no matter what happens. So what is going to be covered is your floors, your walls, your uh, washer and dryer, maybe even a freezer. The things that they determine are um, basement materials are things that are supposed to be in a basement will be covered. It will not cover things like furniture and carpet because it's basically considered that those things don't belong in a basement. A basement is not extra living space. It is there to, in some ways, take water and deal with your larger appliances that um, live in the house, like um, a boiler. So it's going to cover those things, the structure, but it will not cover your personal contents. And I like to keep telling that because I've heard countless stories of people who told me that they lost their family photos and and clothing because they were storing them in the basement and the basement only has to get wet once. And sometimes you might not even have that insurance um, because it only has to get wet once for those things to um, be destroyed. So as we start to look at about things that we can do and how we can fix those issues, here's an image about a home that probably experiences seepage and it has seepage because they have a negative drainage, which means those two slight walks or grassy area that lives along the side of your house may be turned in towards your house. We call that negative, which means that when it rains, that area is going to fill up with water. As you can see what is on my left, um, that area fills up with water. That water sits up against your house. And as we talked about earlier, eventually will be able to seep through your walls and into your home, um, making everything wet on the inside. So our um, solution to say is that is that you fix your so that it becomes positive, it lines up with your home or turns away from your house, and then the water is able to drain away from your home so that it does not sit up against your house. So that just may mean leveling out those sidewalks that have begun to um, seep toward or dig toward your home. The thing that you have to remember when doing this is that it's all great to get water away from your house, but you should not flood your neighbors because it is not nice, okay? The last thing that we have when we start talking about basement backup um, and what you can do about that is in creating a check valve or backwater um, valve. And the way that this works is that there is water as it comes out of your home and the water comes back to the municipality. When that pressure from the water in the municipality starts to put pressure against that door, that door closes. And so it means that although no water from the municipality can get into your home, which means you won't have that basin back up because it's hitting that solid door, it also means that the water coming out of your home cannot get out. So for that time in and during, um, in and right after a rain event, your house has a capacity of water that it can hold because this door is shut. So I tell people who get a check valve, they're really great for keeping sewage out of your home. But if you continue to uh, take long showers, decide to wash all of your clothes, um, flush your toilet a whole lot, you can actually flood yourself 
with your own water. At least it'll only be the water that you've been using into your house. So I tell this to people who have check valves and just to all of us as a whole, as community members, because water and flooding is a community-wide issue. Water does not know boundaries or property lines. That when we are in and right after a major rain event or even a small rain event, because some people do flood every time it rains, we should not do things that cause a lot of water usage inside our homes. So that's not the time to take the 40 minute shower you shouldn't be taking anyway. That's not the time to decide to wash all the clothes in your house and turn your dishwasher on or even wash your dishes by hand because hand washing does use up more water than dishwashing. Um, those are the times to kind of slow down all the water in your home and just do the minimum. Um, my favorite adage during that time is, if it's brown, flush it down. If it's um, yellow, let it mellow, okay? You know what it means, take it to where it goes. Our last thing is to talk about is the green infrastructure with rain gardens. Um, rain gardens are basically a bowl that you have in your front or backyard that has native plants in it. The difference between a native plant and a rain garden and then what you normally see outside, which is mostly grass, is that native plants can have a root system as tall as you are. Um, five, six, seven feet, they can go down into the ground. Those deep, deep roots are very thirsty. They drink a lot of water. They hold the ground in place and they allow, um, they kind of break the ground up a little bit so that it's able to be more absorbent. And they just kind of keep water in its place. They absorb it and keep it in its place. You want to have a rain garden about 10 feet from your home so that it doesn't cause you a seepage issue because it is holding that water in place. Um, but once you have it, there's a lot of people who have claimed their homes to be drier um, or completely dry. Dry is not a word I like to use a whole lot because it's dangerous. But rain gardens definitely can hold that water. They're cheap. You can install them yourselves if you are um, your dirt ready, your shovel ready, and they they just do the job. You want to put in native Illinois plants according to your own taste about which plants you choose. Um, they're just all around the friend friends to us. Um, my only thing is I have some people who have tried to get rid of rain. Say my neighbor has just planted a big pile of weeds in front of their house. And as I got from a tea bag long ago, the only difference between a plant and a weed is judgment. Here's the image of a home that has instituted native plants and some gravel so that they can take some um, water in. They had a serious flooding issue in their home. This is, I believe, a city lot so that you can see how a backyard can look even on a smaller lot. And what they did, they pulled up all of their grass, planted in a tree, put in some other native plants. And um, native plants are also very durable because they can deal with the climate change that we have. So we have flood season in April and part of May. And then we have kind of a drought from the middle of June all the way through July into some parts of August. And then we might have a little bit more rain. These plants can deal with that in and out so that you're not using up a lot of your um, drinking water, trying to keep that grass green. So just one more point, because I didn't really make the point on grass, is that I like to call grass green concrete, because what you see on the top on the, of grass is the root system that it has on its bottom. It's very shallow. It compacts the dirt so that it makes the dirt very hard to infiltrate, which is why we always see that overland flooding so much on grass is because water can't really infiltrate it. And even though it takes a lot of water to keep it um, green and healthy, it just doesn't take in a lot of water as far as rain to just to do something with it. It can't hold it and keep it from, from inundating your, your house, your basement. So um, don't think that because you have grass, you're already on the green path. It's, it's pretty, but it, it just doesn't, it, it's not functional. So just think of it as green concrete. And then last, this is one of the homes that we have that a rain garden, she didn't have 10 feet in front of her house to put her rain garden. So she does have her rain garden fairly close to her home. This is Lori Burns. Um, the Sun-Times just did a story on her this past summer um, talking about flooding and COVID and some of the things that she's been dealing with. But she can say it's been five years now and her home is dry. Still don't like to use that word too often, but that is what she's experiencing. She has a check valve and she has a rain garden. And um, she's one of our great testimonials about how green infrastructure and great infrastructure can work together 
to make us live in a better in a um, new environment where we are enduring more rain. What you also see here on this page is our rain ready tool. So if you're not sure how you're taking in water, you know that sometimes you see water somewhere in your basement or along your walls, but you're not sure where it's coming from. You can type your address in here to my rain ready as long as you're in Cook County. I don't think there's a whole lot of it outside of Cook County um, where it can kind of give you a guided tour of what's most likely happening in your home how you're probably taking in water, and then some um, recommendations about what to do about it. What we found before we got into this game, and part of the reason why we created My Rain Ready or in My Rain Ready at all, um, at all, is that we found that people were having water issues, and then they were going out and maybe hiring Permaseal to come up and seal up their whole home, and they paid six thousand dollars for this process to be done, and then we found out that they had basement backup. And if you have a seepage issue and you put in a um, basement backup solution, you're just going to continue to have an issue and no money to deal with it. So we came in to try to help people understand what their actual problem was so that they could get the right solution and would not waste their money. And that's really the goal that we have. We don't actually do the work, as I stated earlier. We just help people know which work they, um, the work that they need to have done and which problem that they actually have so that they know how to mitigate their issue. And of course, we're also preaching the message of green infrastructure because we're not taught that greening our homes and greening our environments is gonna be the best way that we can deal with it. We have a growing problem with um, climate change. We need something that can grow with it. And that's something that's alive green that can grow with our growing issue. So um, that's really our role. Here are some of the documents that we have created in the past where you can learn about how we first started talking about flooding with the prevalence and cost of urban flooding. It's a case study across of all of Cook County using insurance claims. Um, there's another long thing about six communities we did in the Calumet Corridor, which is um, the six uh, suburbs right south of the city of Chicago. And then we have one Chicago plan, which is in Chatham, which is kind of the bowl of the county where the water is worse, that's where Lori Burns lives and where we'll be doing our next big project to um, try to mitigate water. We'll be doing that alongside Elevate Energy. And so I thank you all. I'm sorry, my name is now Rebecca Cook, but um, still information is good. So thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much today, Rebecca. <clears throat> what great information we're putting out there today. Uh, we've got another uh, panelist ready to come up, and last but certainly not least, we've got Sarah Edwards with the Department for Environment and Sustainability with Cook County. Thank you so much, Sarah, for Thank being here so today. Thank you so much for having me, Commissioner. Um, let me see if I can share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> okay, so um, like Commissioner said, I my name is Sarah Edwards. I work for Cook County's Department of Environment and Sustainability, and I'm going to briefly talk to you about the Solarize Chicagoland program, which is a program that the that Cook County is co-sponsoring and working hard to get the word out, um, helping market it and just spread the word to county residents so that they uh, can find a, an option that makes solar energy for their home more affordable. So it is a group, uh, so it's a solar group by program for homeowners and small business owners. And it's run by the Midwest Renewable Energy Association. It's their program and the Citizens Utility Board, Amy's lovely organization, they are actually the ones that are spearheading it here in the Chicagoland region. So it's intended to both make solar more affordable through it being um, a bulk purchase uh, through you know, really driving um, participation in this program so that the installer knows that there'll be this many people participating so they can buy their, their um, installation items in bulk and, and reduce the cost. Um, but it also is intended to educate the general public about solar energy for their homes. 
I think right now people have a lot of interest in solar, but also have a lot of questions. You know, is it affordable? Um, what tax credits are available? How does solar energy actually work? Does it work for my home? And so uh, Cub is doing an amazing job to work to educate the public about all of those questions. Like I said, Cook County is co-sponsoring this program along with Kane County, DuPage County, and Will County. Um, and is the second year for the program in this region. So some stats about last year, there were 135 homeowners participating in the program and 69 of those were from Cook County. And from Cook County in this program, over 420 kilowatts of solar were installed on people's homes. So you can see here in this map, I know it's very tiny, it's hard, Cook County is very long, so it's hard to fit it into uh, slides, but you can see the representation of where um, people participated in the program and got solar installed in their home. There's a lot in Chicago because Chicago is one large municipality, but you can see there's also a various amount, a lot in the uh, northern suburbs. So program details. Like I said, the program takes advantage of volume purchasing. So it can reduce the um, upfront costs of installing solar on homes. And also it reduces costs through the fact that um, the Citizens Utility Board and all of the counties are working on marketing and promoting it. So the installer doesn't need to do that. So that's not a cost that they will um, you know, pass along to you. Uh, additionally, the more people that participate, the lower the cost is. So there are four benchmarks for the program, and each time the program hits one of those benchmarks, the price gets cheaper for everyone that ends up participating. So the four benchmarks are 50 kilowatts of solar contracted for 150 kilowatts, 250, and then finally 500. So Solarize has already hit the third benchmark for this year. So you'll see here from this lovely graphic, um, we've already hit the 250 kilowatt benchmark, which means based on the average system, which an average system in this area is um, 6.5 kilowatts of solar installed in your home, that means that you'll have roughly $1,000 off um, your system price just by the fact that we've hit that benchmark. And so we're really excited that we've hit the third benchmark and we're hoping to hit the fourth benchmark, which means more people will participate as well as the price will get lower for everyone. A few more details about the program. Um, the Midwest Renewable Energy Association runs the competitive RFP process to select an installer for the program. And this year's installer is Winfrey Solar. And then, like I mentioned, CUB works to provide these solar power hours, which are a free virtual this year presentation which educates people about solar in general so you know um how does solar get installed on my house how does it connect to the grid uh what should i be doing on my home before i'm thinking about solar those types of things or does solar even make sense in illinois um that question comes up a lot it also goes over the available tax credit information because there's both a state tax credit still available for solar installations as well as a federal tax credit that's available. Um, and then as well talks about all the specifics of the Solarize Chicagoland program. And just as a heads up, the deadline to sign a contract for this program is September 30th. So it's rapidly approaching, which is why we're very excited that we can talk to you about today um, so that if you're interested, you can find out more information. There are two upcoming solar power hours. There's one on the third from 1 to 2 p.m., which is co-hosted by Madison Public Library, but anyone can attend the beauty of a virtual presentation, as well as there is one on the 10th from 6 to 7 p.m. And you can register here. It's solarizechicagoland.com. Um, if you can't make one of these times, there's more program materials as well as sections of the pre-recorded webinar on this website as well. You can go to growsolar.org slash chicagoland slash virtual dot packet. It's also the same website as Solar, Solar I Chicagoland. It just has two names. So if you go to solarichicagoland.com and you look for more program information, you'll be able to find it there. So say you are interested in you, you attend the solar power hour or you look at the information and you're interested possibly in the program, the next step would be, a, be to fill out a, a basic contact information form that would be sent to Winfrey Solar. And then they would do a free um, assessment to see, 
what do, if solar makes sense for your home like do you have too much shading or are you in a good space for this and then if it does make sense for your home they would um, let you know what the size would be for the panels uh, for the installation excuse me as well as the cost for it and then you know tell you all the information about a potential contract and things of that nature so just as an example this is a solarized participant from last year um, this gentleman was actually the first uh, install of the program last year it's a single family home located in hoffman estates the system is 28 um, 310 watt solar panels totaling 8.68 kilowatts. Um, but like I said earlier, 6.5 kilowatts is around the average size for uh, installation in this area for the program. So based on his numbers, um, the panels will pay for themselves in about four years after the uh, tax credits and the incentives that are available. And so he'll have, a, he'll have an about expected savings of $1,500 a year, which is why he was very interested in the program. And he found out about the program by attending a solar power hour hosted by Cub and by my department last year. So again, relevant information, the website is solarizechicagoland.com. Um, you can certainly reach out to me. I can answer general information. My email address is sarah.edwards at cookcountyil.gov. But if you have very specific questions, you should reach out to Christina Uzo at Cub with those questions. She's the point person for the program in this area and she's doing a phenomenal job. And so her email address is cuzo at citizensutilityboard.org and it's also on the Solarized Chicagoland website. And that is all I have. That is amazing, Sarah, I got a just uh, thank you for using a Hoffman Estates example. Amazing. I know, I was very excited when I remembered the first one was in Hoffman Estates. So there you go. <laughs> go 15 district. Amazing. Uh, so we're going to bring back some of our panelists. Uh, if anyone who's still watching us live have any questions for any of our presenters today, please feel free uh, to put those in, uh, um, in the comments and we'll be happy to get to them. Uh, awesome. How are you guys feeling? Good. <laughs> I was glad to see Mattson on the list. I'll be moving there today, which is why my shelf has nothing on it behind me. I was going to send you a couple books. Good uh, <laughs> you know, I have my bookcase all set up and I just need to find a way to reorient my desk uh, so that it could be in the background, but you know. We're all slacking a little bit during COVID times. Uh, I'll reorient everything at some point. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, let's see. So uh, we have, let's see if any questions have come in. Okay, perfect. Um, awesome. Well, let's see. Uh, one question for uh, for Amy. I is, is it less expensive to go with a different supplier than ComEd? Usually, no. Um, there are there are teaser rates, like I said, so they may offer a rate that is a little bit cheaper than ComEd, but it only lasts for a certain amount of time. Um, and there are some municipal aggregation deals that are cheaper than ComEd. So if you live in a town that is currently in a municipal aggregation contract or is considering one, you are probably okay sticking with that particular deal. So um, I think that in certain circumstances, there are savings to be had, but statistically, it's more likely that you're going to overpay if you go with an alternative supplier. Amazing, amazing. Uh, Bridget uh, Karen's asked if there will be a transcript or PowerPoints made avail available from our conversations today. This video uh, is gonna be on my Facebook uh, for eternity as long as Facebook exists. But um, if the panelists, if you don't mind sharing your uh, PowerPoints, we'd be happy to, to get those out. Uh, and Bridget, if you just send us a private message with your email, we'll be happy to send those to you. Uh, awesome. Uh, thank you, Amy, for that question, too. Uh, for Elevate, which is, I'm sorry, is it Vitya with Elevate? Uh, what can I do today to be more energy efficient and save money? Hello? Hi, Vitya. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. You can't see me, maybe, because my connection's 
Uh oh, now we lost her. Okay, we'll go to another question. Uh, amazing. Uh, Sarah, uh, why is now the best time to participate in this program? Yes. So this is a great time to participate in Solar Chicagoland because there is both a state tax credit available as well as a federal tax credit. Um, but that's only available right now. So the state tax credit, it's called an SREC. Um, they, they're expecting it to run out. Um, you know, as more people participate, it's not uh, unlimited funding. So this is a great time to participate if you are interested as well as the federal tax credit, um, right now it's at 26%. You'll get 20, you know, 20 26% of your installation uh, costs, you'll get back um, as a tax credit. Uh, but that decreases next year to 22%. And then as of right now, disappears in 2022. So if you are interested, this is a, a great time uh, to be able to get those incentives. Amazing, thank you so much. And my favorite type of question for Rebecca, uh, how can residents encourage their local municipality to provide rain-ready resources? Um, they can organize, which might be a little difficult in a time of COVID, but uh, I tell people all the time, if you live in the city, then call 311. If you don't live in a city, call your municipality every time you have a, a flooding issue. Um, put pressure on your uh, aldermen or your village trustees to consider doing a community-wide program. Um, like I said, we don't really do things on an individual level, but Rain Ready will come out and, and we can be commissioned to do plans and give recommendations on a community-wide level. The residents of Oak Park have done that and they have a plan that's been working really well for them for the past uh, three years. Well, Matt also did it. Um, wow. So it's, it's putting pressure on, on your elected officials to say, this is the issue that does need to be addressed. And um, they actually look for a solution on a community basis. Really to honestly, you can't deal with flooding on a home by home basis, not deal with it well. You might be able to stop your own home from flooding, but in most cases, you're probably gonna make your neighbor flood. Um, so if we deal with it on a community level, then we really know that we're solving the problem and not just pushing it around. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much for that. And Vitya, we have you back. Uh, my question for you was, what can I do today to be more energy efficient and save money? What you can do, um, that's my lovely son in the background. Um, hey, buddy. Um, <laughs> he's special needs and he's just the worst. <laughs> today, he's just, he's just, he's just... <laughs> One of those days. Um, I would say um, to be more energy efficient in your home is to just be more conscious of how you're using your energy. So um, if you were to sign up for any of the programs that we talked about that Comet offers because, or Amarin offers, I, I think actually Comet offers them, Amarin, Amarin does have some pricing programs. Um, so just making choices, like how can you, because it's not just one thing that you do, you want to do them all. It's, you know, and that's when you kind of see the difference that it makes um, in your cost savings. So, for instance, you know, unplugging things when you go to bed, um, plugging things when you're done with them, making sure you're not just washing two pairs of pants in your laundry, um, and signing up for programs where you can save money that alert you when you can, you know, reduce your energy costs. So small little, small things, but all of those things add up so you can start cost saving right now. Amazing, amazing. No, I have I, a question. Yeah. I have a question for Solarize. Um where where is this lady? Which one are you? Hi Vitia. It's Sarah. I'm on I'm here. I, can't really I know you're on your phone. I'm here. Well these glasses are these glasses are only like fashion glasses. They're not real. <laughs> it doesn't help. But um so so Elevate, we, you know, we have the ILSPA program, Illinois Solar for All, um, which is, is uh, focuses more on low income or, 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 or organizations or people that have property and, and areas under the AMI, right, in that area. So, so what is the difference? Because 
I live in Schaumburg. A lot of my territory is in the Northwest suburbs. So I would, I don't know what the conversation, I've never heard of solar rise and that's not, I'm not part of solar, but we do talk about it in our conversations when we do presentations. So can you say more about the connection or lack of connection? So um, they are different, but I was going to say, so in the solar power hour, um, Christina from Cub goes in depth to yeah. into yeah. Illinois Solar for All. What was that, Vatia? I said I'm already signed up. Perfect. So she goes in depth. So she they talk about solar in many ways in the in the power hour. So um, they talk about Illinois Solar for All and they talk about the options that are available um, for AMI. Like if you qualify, then you can be getting solar through this program. And she also talks about um, community solar. So, you know, if you can't put it on your your roof for a variety of reasons of which a lot of people in Chicagoland can't put it on their roof. Is there an option to right. be supporting right. solar? Right. So right. she goes and in, she goes into all those details. This is just like a different program that's also just trying to get solar out there, and it runs for just so a specific this, time. So is this a program for people? This is not low income. This is for this is just for everyone. Well, this is so just for everyone. If you're a presentation in October about solar in Schaumburg, and I don't know. If, I mean, do you want to come? I don't know if maybe you should be someone that I should bring along with, with me. Yeah. So, so unfortunately, if it's in October, the program won't be available. So it only runs like from well, this year because of COVID, we got started a little bit late. But it only runs from May through the end of September. And so the idea is to try and like get as many participants as possible so that they can participate from the group aspect of it. So it's like it puts pressure on the fact like you need to participate so that we know how many people will participate so that everyone can get a lower price. But the hope is that possibly we will also offer it next year, but it, it just, uh, we don't know yet, you know? Okay. Okay. Thanks, Patia. Got it. I'm mm -hmm. glad you're signed up already. <laughs> uh, curious. Incredible, curious. incredible. I honestly have loved all the information shared today. For those of you who may have tuned in a little bit later but are still watching live, if you haven't registered yet, it is not too late. Go to the link in the comments and register. Now you could win a smart thermostat. And I wanna make sure that one of our viewers Where? wins because I know one of you will. So go register. Give it away. Say it again. It's from ISA funding. Cook County is, so we're also an ISIF grantee, but we're just a smaller one. And so we're we're giving away through some ISIF funding. It'll be a nest awesome. thermostat. Yep. That's awesome. Okay, cool. I'm signing up. Oh, amazing, amazing. Well, I want to thank all my panelists for taking the time out of your day to share such incredibly insightful information. Sustainability is an issue that's incredibly important to me. Uh, I want to see a green and better future. I want to make sure that when uh, my nephews grow up, they have a healthy environment to grow up in. And that's why I'm pushing for uh, many policies to help uh, protect our uh, local environment moving forward on the county level. Uh, I want to give each of our panelists a last word. If you would like to share something, I'll start with uh, you, Sarah. I don't think I have any last words, but I just want to say thank you to everyone. Thank you for having us, Commissioner, and thank you to Rebecca, Vatia, and Amy for sharing amazing uh, information. These resources are so valuable, and I hope people will take advantage of them. Sarah, you rock. Thank you so much. Uh, and how about you, Amy? Um, I couldn't have said it better myself. Thanks to everyone who tuned in. Um, Make sure to visit the Cub website for information. I think there's a lot of overlap between awesome. all of our websites, of course, but yeah. So www.citizensutilityboard.org, from which you can also access all of our social. Amazing, amazing. And for everyone who registered, we'll make sure to send out the con uh, contact information for all these wonderful organizations uh, in, in a follow-up email. Uh, Rebecca, good luck moving. Thank you. Um, I want to say thank you all for watching. Um, remember that water is a community problem, so it needs a community solution. And that what you do does affect not only your household, but your neighbors. So think about that when you make your water Amazing. choices. Thank you so much. Very, very wise words. And last but certainly not uh, least, Vitia, live from Schomburg. Thank you for being here. Any last words?
Hi from Schomburg. <laughs> well, hey, that's the 15th. I think this conver these conversations, I, I just appreciate um, and that we're doing this and we're all figuring out our different organizations coming together because there's so much happening in the world and around us individually and, and to continue to be a support system or to um, continue to educate people about how there are resources still, even though it looks like the world is crumbling and it feels like that, right? Let's be honest, it feels like the world is crumbling, yet there are still resources and there are still people that wanna help and make a difference. I agree, and I agree. No. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, sorry. You cut out thank you. No, of course. Of course. No, honestly, it's been so great to have you four here today. Uh, I really appreciate uh, all the incredible information you helped get out to our district and uh, everyone else who follows my page. Uh, but you're right. It is a stressful time. We've got a lot of different pressures falling on our backs. Uh, but there's a lot of incredible people like the four people on our panel today who are trying to make this world a better place. And so I thank each of you uh, and I wish everyone well and health and safety in the coming days. Thank you. Oh, and oh, one thank last you. shout out. Tomorrow in uh, Poplar Creek Library, there's a, shed, a shredding event. So if you have a lot of paper like I do that needs shredding, go to Poplar Creek I'm Library there. out here in the 15th. I'm, I'm there. I'm there. I have a whole back. I was I was <laughs> to this into the July. <laughs> Perfect. Amazing. Thank, Thank you, you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you for Bye. having us. Thank